Uh, Thomas Daniel is an architect and partner of the Japanese office FOBA. Uh, founded in 1995 by Katsu Umabayashi, FOBA is a widely published 12-person architectural practice that is already a formidable portfolio of buildings, primarily houses, that collectively constitute an ongoing body of research on the contemporary dwelling. Tom Dan Daniel teaches at Kyoto University and Kyoto Sekai uh, University and works in various editing capacities uh, at the Architectural Institute of Japan Journal and Arcus Magazine. Um, and of course, as well as his practice uh, with FOBA as an architect. He is currently on his way to New York uh, to participate uh, and deliver uh, a talk at the conference at the Architectural League, um, How Does Housing Design Matter? Uh, it's a great privilege to have him take his, share his evening with us here at SciArc, so I think we'll all enjoy this an awful lot. Thanks. Please welcome Tom. Um, uh, thank you, Tim. That, that was very kind. Um, uh, I, it's a privilege for me too. Uh, when I uh, first graduated uh, in architecture, did my undergraduate degree in New Zealand, uh, I wanted to study in SIAC, postgraduate, uh, and uh, I never made it. So finally, 12 years later, I, I'm at SIAC. <laughs> um, so can I, be I begin by saying that uh, FOBA is not my office, it's, uh, it's Katsu Mabayashi's office. So al although I'm introducing the work, the majority of credit goes to Katsu. Uh, but it's, as, as Tim said, it's a 12-person office. Uh, the people, all the people in the office make a significant contribution to the work, uh, which is one of the reasons the works, uh, one of the reasons the work looks so varied. Uh, but the other reason uh, that I, I want to, before I show the projects, I want to just say that uh, uh, each of the projects is done uh, in a very contextual way. Uh, contextual in every sense except aesthetic, which might seem a strange thing to say when, uh, for a lot of architects, contextualism means uh, aesthetic contextualism only. But the projects are all uh, intended to, uh, in a way, translate or interpret uh, a particular context, the particular site they're in, the city or the country or wherever they happen to be. Uh, and to kind of, uh, not in, not in a, any sort of scientific uh, analytical way, but in a, a, a metaphorical, intuitive way, to uh, reveal the kind of, uh, the, the organization that is uh, implicit uh, to a particular place and turn that into a way of organizing uh, a building. Uh, and then once that uh, diagram uh, of organization has been extracted from, uh, from the context, uh, then the next stage is to is to make the space. And at a conceptual level, at FOB, we don't see space uh, as as a pre-existing uh, something to be partitioned, uh, but rather as something to be made and shaped and sculpted. Of course, we don't mean that in a realistic way, but as as a way of looking at at making buildings. So if I begin by just uh, explaining the way we look at making space uh, as a, a kind of a preamble to to showing the the projects themselves. So. The first image, this is uh, uh, Rachel Whiteread's sculpture, uh, House, uh, which was in London uh, for a, a very brief period. Uh, and uh, I guess many of you will know this sculpture. It was built by uh, pouring concrete inside an existing house, then taking away the house. So what you have is, is a cast of the interior space of uh, a house. Uh, and uh, so that's perhaps the way we look at, uh, at making spaces. To, to see the space as the solid thing to be shaped, uh, and then to let the, let the, if I look at the next image, uh, to let, we skipped one, oh no, but anyway, uh, to let the, uh, the form be a result of the sculpting of space. And then in terms of uh, sculpting space, we um, have uh, categorized the work we've done into four different uh, types of making space. This was a, a post-rationalization. It's not the way we designed the projects, it's the way we look at, at the projects after they'd been built and we were able to categorize the work that had been done. So the first, the first way of making space uh, for us was uh, to extrude it, rather to, to add uh, new spaces to the, to the core of the building, not, by, uh, not in a cellular, a cellular way, but by uh, extruding and stretching and distorting the existing spaces uh, in a, let's say, in a, perhaps in a geometrical way or in a um, in a way that's very functional, uh, but uh, kind of a function, following the function, but in, in a very kind of uh, free way as, a, as in a factory. Uh, and then the second way of making space is just to wrap it, just to uh, take a single surface and, and cover up what, whatever uh, program or whatever spaces are within the building. To, to give a kind of a, 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 a impose a geometric order on uh, something that might be more free uh, and fluid uh, below it. 
the third way just to sex, sex stuff up, not to make any kind of uh, uh, sensitive relationship between the different functions of the different volumes, but just to simply put them next to one another. So perhaps uh, you know, to take some very disparate elements and stack them up vertically, or to take uh, similar elements and to uh, arrange them into a composition where it, it once again becomes a, a coherent composition uh, at the end. And then the, the fourth and final way would be to uh, excavate space where you uh, assume that the building volume is a solid uh, object and then the spaces are carved out of that uh, solid object as caves with some uh, a very uh, deep interiors with a, 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 quite a, a distance between the exterior and the interior. I like this Chilita uh, sculpture. So uh, from there I'll... Um, now show some uh, of the actual projects and I hope that these these four uh, ways of looking at making space that I just explained become clearer uh, through the, the projects themselves. So the first project I want to show is uh, the first project the office ever did. It is our office. This is the office building uh, where we work uh, and uh, the name of the building is Organ and uh, the idea of the building is that it's a uh, it's only one room. That's a single continuous space. It's a tubular uh, continuous space that begins at the front door and extrudes up into space, uh, doubles back on itself, uh, inflects and distorts to contain the, the program inside. There's only uh, one door inside and that's to the toilet. Everything else is part of the, uh, the same continuous uh, open space. So in a way the building is like a, um, it's like a corridor but there are no rooms attached to the corridor. And uh, so it's, it's, let's say, it's the opposite of, of, of Lewis Kahn's separation of, uh, of served and servant space. Uh, here, everything is both. It's, it's all uh, the primary program and the circulation happening in the same, uh, the same space. So there's the building itself. Uh, when it was designed, uh, it was intended to cover the entire site, uh, but um, at the time there was three staff and no work and we really didn't need a, an enormous building. So uh, half of the building was built, half of the tube, uh, and half of the site stayed empty. And the idea was that the two, uh, on the, on the left-hand side and the, and the far right side, the two ends of the tubes, uh, when, uh, when more space was needed, those windows would be removed, uh, the, the tubes extruded further, stretched, uh, and then uh, the windows put back in place. So, uh, in a sense, it's like uh, an, an updated version of the, the metabolism of, of 1960s and early 70s uh, Japanese architecture, which was the, the Japanese contribution to, to the megastructural themes what, that ha were uh, dominating the discourse uh, at that point in history. Uh, the, the Japanese idea of metabolism, uh, where you saw a city or a building as a growing, evolving thing. Uh, unfortunately, it, the, it never really took off, and the reason for that was it was too reliant on megastructure, because it, you had to begin with an enormous frame within which you plug in the, the modules. Uh, and so uh, the problem was that, of course, the original frame, which was a huge investment of, of uh, money and resources, the technology, of course, went out of date very quickly. So if you take uh, Kisho Kurokawa's very famous uh, Capsule K hotel building in Tokyo, built in, I think, 71, which, which was uh, a concrete uh, tower, which contained the infrastructure and the circulation, and then uh, stainless steel, well, not stainless, anyway, steel uh, capsules were uh, attached to the exterior of the, of the concrete tower. The idea was that they could be removed and relocated and, and added to uh, as uh, became necessary over time. The building's never changed since the day it was built, uh, and I think it now it is even a protected building, which is, I think, the ultimate irony that a, a building that's about uh, flow and change would become a, a monument. So anyway, this is a metabolism, this is a neo-metabolism that doesn't need the mega frame. The entire system is uh, evolving. So here's, here's the, the front door down below. One of the reasons it's up off the ground is so we can use the, uh, the ground level for parking. And here are some of the interior spaces. So as I say, it's all one room. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, I mean, it's an office building, and of course, uh, logically, an office building should be a, an open square box, a, a universal space, a, a Miesian universal space, which is uh, the kind of the ultimate uh, functional flexibility, because uh, if nothing is uh, determined uh, in terms of the shape of the spaces, uh, anything is possible. But it's a kind of a loose fit uh, uh, multifunctionality. And in this case, the building has a set of uh, different shapes of, of space, different um, uh, 
uh, corners and alcoves, which are all part of the main space. Uh, and the building has been rearranged several times uh, in terms of uh, functionally, in terms of where the desks are and where the library is and where the photocopier is. And we see it as providing a palette of spaces. So it's uh, rather than making uh, completely uh, um, uh, free, generic, universal space, instead here is a, a palette of different uh, spaces that can be used for different functions. And uh, actually, uh, there's actually two buildings here. Um, the, f the first building I showed you, which was the first half of the tube, uh, was our office. The idea was that we would expand and extend. Uh, but before that happened, the engineers we were working with said, we would like to use the rest of that site uh, for our headquarters building. Uh, and we said, sure, but uh, FOB will be the architects, uh, and which they agreed to, but they didn't agree to being part of our continuous tube. So here you can see where the tube is split. Uh, conceptually, that should be, uh, those two ends should be connected, but uh, they weren't willing to, and I guess we weren't really willing to be part of their office either. But so the second building, Organ 2, uh, is, um, is also a, a continuous space, but it's a, it's a bigger building and it's more complex. Uh, and so uh, there you can see there are parts where, for example, I think on the third level there in the background, you can see there's an aluminium skin behind the glass because at that point the tube has passed through itself. So a triple height space is divided into three levels by the tube passing within uh, kind of an inverted uh, organ. This is the courtyard between the two, the two projects. And some of the, uh, the interiors. This is uh, now organ two. As I said, this is all one room, one, one space. So what looks like a strange shaped building is actually, it's a strange space that has just been given a skin, an aluminum skin. And there they are, in a very uh, uh, suburban neighborhood. In fact, this, this neighborhood, it's not, it, we're in Kyoto, but it's not actually Kyoto City, it's, it's actually a place called Uji City, which is, it's like a suburb of Kyoto. It's where the aristocracy used to live when Kyoto was the capital. Uh, and so we're right uh, at the edge uh, of, of the, the urban part. If you go too much further uh, out away from Kyoto, it becomes tea fields and forests and mountains. So this is the periphery. So in a way, the building is like a, a metaphor for the periphery. It's an expanding, uh, evolving, slightly ragged, uh, slightly awkward, unfinished composition. So it, you know, it's not a scientific analysis of the context, but it is a metaphorical uh, response to, to the context. You would never build this in the central city, obviously. And so just to, to go through that, the, the concept behind the building, you begin with the tube, you stretch and distort the tube uh, based on a kind of a choreography of program, uh, and then uh, turn it into a building. So the, um, the next project I'll show, this is a, this is a, um, this is a little uh, country villa. It's right out in the, the countryside near the Japan Sea coast. And uh, the reason I, I want to show this next is because it, it, spatially it continues the same, uh, the same concepts that were behind the organ building in terms of continuous space uh, as a, a choreography in relationship to its context. The client said they wanted something that looks like a traditional house, so we kind of tricked them into something that sort of looks like a traditional house, but uh, spatially is, is um, uh, not at, at all traditional, but it's, it's a kind of an inversion of a traditional house. So um, what you have is uh, a series of concentric uh, spaces. Uh, concentric layers of space. Um, the, the traditional Japanese house is, is planned based on a concept called oku, which uh, translates basically as depth. Uh, as you go further into the house, you get into a more private spaces, more personal spaces, darker spaces, depending on how uh, closely you are, uh, your relationship with the family depends to what depth you'll get into the house. Uh, and so the, the houses, the, the spaces right at the rear of the house are the most private. Uh, in this case, because the house is in the countryside, it's not, there are no houses close by. Uh, there are views and there are gardens. So uh, the concept of oku was here reversed. The first thing you do is you, um, you see the white tunnel. That's the front door. You, go, you penetrate directly into the center of the house. Uh, and right at the center of the house is something called an irori, which is a barbecue, a, like a little hearth set in the floor. And that's the focus of the house. And then the common space is, is right in the center there. The blue uh, ring you see is storage and structure and, and wet air uh, pipes and, and et cetera. Uh, and then the yellow spaces are the private rooms, the individual rooms. So uh, in fact, uh, instead of a, a hierarchy going from exterior uh, outdoor space then to the common areas inside the house and right down to the, the private areas at the, the very back, um, in, instead it's the private areas that mediate between the common central space and the exterior space. 
So it's, it's an Oku uh, design house that's been inverted. Some shots of the model, the study model. So, um, as I was just explaining, it's, it's basically concentrically arranged in terms of the, the main functional divisions, uh, and then it's further developed in response to specific uh, elements uh, around the house in terms of views and gardens, uh, and which finally results in these concentric squares. Uh, the, the, out, the outer edge is pleated uh, into this kind of uh, irregular uh, outer perimeter wall in response to things happening inside and things happening outside. It, it takes up the slack in both directions. The name of the house is Pleats because of the shape of that exterior wall. And here you can see the way we would then uh, expand the house in future. And here's the house itself. These photos were taken before the gardens were done, unfortunately. So uh, it's just sitting on, on dirt. Uh, and you can see the context here. The, the, the trees, the mountains, the neighbors are not very close. So the front door, and then uh, penetrating through uh, the tube right to the center of the house. And this is the, the central space. And the, the little square on the floor, that's the irori, the, the barbecue. Uh, people sit on the floor in, in Japanese houses. So, uh, and then you have a skylight above. And then the uh, peripheral spaces all relating to that, uh, all expanding away from that central core. And so this photo looks distorted, but that's, that's an accurate uh, image uh, based on of, of what the, the floor looks like. And then the central space uh, is at a higher level uh, than the, the peripheral spaces. So someone standing on one of the outer rooms is at eye level with someone sitting uh, in the central space. Another uh, connection between the levels. And then, in fact, the, the, the circulation route, which is a, a square ring, uh, just outside this, the storage area, passes through uh, some of the other spaces. So the circulation actually passes through the, the bathroom between the hand basin and the, uh, the bath. There's, there's a, a sliding translucent wall for privacy. And that's what the gardens uh, pretty much now look like um, in response to the, the way the house expands. Um, the, each, each little slot has a different uh, kind of planting. Uh, and so in a way, it's like this house, because it's out in the countryside, it's, been, it's like a plant that's been overdosed with uh, nutrients and sunlight. So it's, it's kind of ex exploded outwards, expanded outwards in a very um, lively way. Uh, and then uh, just finally, um, one project that wasn't built, we were asked to make a proposal, a, a villa for Kyoto, uh, which is again kind of an extruded uh, building, uh, which in Kyoto you have um, these very uh, long and narrow sites. They're called eels nests because they're, they're where a, an eel would sleep. And the reason for that is um, historically property taxes were based on the street frontage, not on the floor, not on the area of the site. So everyone built their sites uh, very narrow and very deep. Uh, and of course Kyoto is a low city. It has these beautiful uh, mountains around the perimeter of the city. Uh, and if you built a, uh, if you build tall on a particular site, you are really um, inconveniencing the neighbors, you're blocking their sun. Uh, so we s propose that if you do want to build tall, you should only be able to build partially tall on your site. So you can take half of your site up tall and the other half has to stay low. And that's uh, the view from the, the, upper, the upper bedroom part. And that's what it would happen if you, um, you build a lot of them. You would kind of make a porous city where uh, there are taller buildings, but they're not completely blocking the sun from their neighbors. Uh, okay, the next project uh, I want to show you is, this is in Tokyo, but it's also on a, a similar, um, very narrow, long site. It's another eel's nest site. This site is uh, 2.5 meters wide by uh, 18 meters long which in most cities would be an alleyway, but in, in the center of Tokyo, it's valuable land and it's space enough for a house. Uh, and there's the house in, in context. If you know Tokyo, the towers in the background are uh, Shinjuku, the government district. 
so basically, um, in a site this small, uh, the, the usual way to, of, of dealing with the problem is always uh, uh, light and air into the center of the house. And the usual way of dealing with that in traditional architecture and in contemporary architecture is a central courtyard garden, an atrium bringing in uh, light and air. Uh, here, things, conditions were so tight that to do that would be uh, an unacceptable waste of floor area. So uh, instead, the entire uh, exterior visible surface is covered with a translucent tent. That's a, a fiberglass fabric uh, coated with Teflon. It's the same fabric that's used on a lot of uh, uh, sport uh, domes, arenas, Tokyo Dome, for example. Um, there's the house in its context. Uh, wedged in between two uh, neighboring buildings. Um, now, this kind of fabric roof, uh, to stop it going slack over time, you have to make a, a double curve. If you make a double curve, it's always pulling against itself so it can never go slack. So that was achieved by making uh, two parallel concrete walls uh, running down either side of the site. They're exactly the same shape, but one is uh, reversed, the reverse of the other. So you get this kind of saddle-like uh, roof form. And that's the effect of the translucent skin. with uh, images projected from the interior. The uh, client's daughter told us it looked like a fish because of the eye. And this is the, um, the upper level um, below the, the tent uh, roof. Uh, it's connected. It's, there aren't doors inside this building either. It's, um, the, the levels are all connected. Uh, you can see there's kind of a, a, a little mezzanine type balcony at the far end there. So um, because the, the two roof lines of the two, opposing, the two different walls move in different directions, um, the beams that separate the walls that, that brace against the tension in the tent uh, also have to follow those two opposing roof lines. So you get this twisting uh, effect in the beams. It's, it's a completely logical solution to, uh, to the, the problem of the double curvature roof, which uh, however strange it looks. So there you see the basic diagram of the way the house is uh, designed. There's the two parallel walls, uh, two uh, floor levels inside, uh, the, the tent roof and the twisting uh, sequence of beams. And uh, this is a model we made to show uh, an, an inversion of the space. The space is shown solid uh, and the solid parts are shown as voids. So this is the, the shape of the space that was intended. And there you see the section where it's, it's much clearer the way the, uh, the beams twist to give the twisting uh, shape in the roof. And uh, just to show you briefly, this, this project wasn't built, but the, cli uh, the client for this project saw the, the previous house under construction and thought, here are some architects who enjoy being in confined spaces. So he had a site even smaller uh, in, in the Ginza in Tokyo. Uh, I think it was, it was two meters wide by uh, eight meters long. Uh, and, uh, we, and he wanted to build a shop, but re really all you could do in a shop of, of this scale was to build a staircase with, with large landings, and the landings were the shop. That was the, the first sketch showing it wedged into its context. And uh, in the first case, it, it was a kind of a wrapping of the entire space available. In this case, uh, it was designed by taking a much larger form, kind of an egg-shaped form, and imposing it over the site and taking the sliver of that form that uh, overlapped with the open space available. There you can see the way, the way it was done. And then... Um, if I show you uh, briefly another project that involved uh, wrapping things up, this was a conversion of an, a traditional townhouse in Kyoto into an art gallery. Uh, you can see th from the street the only uh, the, the visible uh, aspect of the uh, uh, renovation is the, the white part on the right-hand side. Uh, it's all done in steel and, and uh, fiber-reinforced plastic, but um, in a kind of a, a formal language that, re that relates to the, the traditional houses. It's not too incongruous. And then inside uh, the main space, um, uh, we left most of it as it was, but, but inserted this uh, staircase wrapped in a, a, a fabric, uh, which takes you up to the, uh, the upper level of the gallery. That was really pretty much all the, uh, the obvious intervention that was done. Going up the stair and looking back down. 
uh, and this is some of the, this is not the gallery, this is the rear part of the house which is still being used to live in. The, the, the clients were just using the front part of the house as, as a gallery. Uh, but as, as I mentioned before, the traditional Japanese house is based on this principle of oku, which is uh, about a one, a one directional progression deeper into the house and it does get darker. So we made, instead made a loop of, of circulation and opened up the house to the rear to bring in light from, from behind uh, as well as from the front. And uh, these, these three uh, curving surfaces to wrap, to wrap them up. Uh, and then uh, a project that's under construction right now in, in the Gion uh, district of Kyoto, which is the geisha district. This is the annex to a, to a geisha tea house. Uh, and the, the tea house has been a part of the same family for, for many generations. The current uh, daughter, uh, who's about 30 right now, she's our client. She, uh, there's a, obviously, there's a lot of money available uh, because these places, are, they, um, they're very expensive, the geisha tea houses. And, uh, but she's a very contemporary uh, modern girl and she, uh, she's interested in the fine arts and she wants to build an annex to the tea house that's uh, a contemporary art gallery. So a very, very small uh, annex because that's all that's available and the, uh, I guess we wanted to make something that certainly didn't, that made it very clear what was new and what was old, that didn't kind of, um, you know, to build something that was too sensitive to the existing building would, would actually damage its authenticity probably. So what we've done is uh, basically a, a double height, well, it's uh, bigger than a double height, but a, a very large glass box and inside that glass box there's a, a, a second space floating which is wrapped in a tent uh, fabric which you can see um, in this image behind the glass uh, which um, would have video images projected on it. So here is inside. The lower level is the gallery with the change, with no permanent collection, with a changing collection. Uh, and the upper level is like a private salon where friends of the, of the owner would have uh, private parties up here. And then uh, another project, another very special uh, Japanese program. This is a love hotel. Uh, hotels that are rented uh, by, by the hour. Uh, for basically for couples or for you know even married couples or, or young teenage couples because there's uh, a problem with privacy in, in Japanese houses there's not much there's not much privacy so this is where people can get away from from everyone else for for an hour so the most kind of private event becomes kind of a public uh, planned outing and uh, this building was designed by um, again taking a single uh, surface and wrapping the entire from, it, it floats above the parking level, so the underside, up the front facade, across the roof, and back down the other side, is uh, uh, wrapped, and then the, the kind of perforations uh, in that wrapped surface change vary as they go uh, around the building. That's from the rear. A, b a big pond of water out the back. This building was built. Uh, we had some problems with the client, though, and he, he fired us during construction. So because he wanted some changes to the image of the building that we wouldn't accept, uh, he wanted to make it far more. If you've been to Japan, you've seen what love hotels look like. They're very crass, vulgar buildings. They, they try and look like chateaus, French chateaus or, or whatever, but in a very kind of cartoon-like, uh, facile way. And we wanted to make something more, more uh, respectable architecturally. He wanted us to change it. Uh, we, we said no. Uh, why did you hire us if you're going to say that? And uh, what it was built... Uh, it was built to our plan. The plan is basically the same, but the image of the building is, is different, and so we don't use images of the finished building in our portfolio. This is what it should have looked like. The, uh, the Ronchamp facade, to give it a kind of a, a spiritual uh, atmosphere. Or by night. Yeah. And some of the interior spaces, because of, I'm sorry, because of the, um, the different, uh, uh, different shapes of perforations, the different, each of the rooms uh, has a different uh, kind of uh, light to our, uh, natural light coming in, of course with frosted glass. And uh, instead of making all the rooms kind of lurid designs, we wanted just to make them all the same lurid shade of red on every surface. That's one of the upper levels, so you have the, the skylight above. Uh, and then uh, another project that we were actually commissioned to do by the, uh, the Tokyo Electric Power Company. They wanted us to design a, a prototype for a solar house. So this mesh is a solar mesh. Uh, the house itself is shipping containers uh, stacked up and then the mesh is kind of slightly uh, separated from the, the containers so you get this uh, intermediate space 
you have outside, you have space screened by a solar mesh, and then you have the actual interior proper. And we propose this because of the, the, the very freeway, the, the containers can be stacked up. We proposed it as a, the kind of building that can be uh, located anywhere at all. So the, the containers get these little mini kitchens or, or mini bathrooms inserted in them. Uh, balconies, the staircase elements can be done in a very modular way, stacked up and then wrapped with the, uh, the solar, the solar uh, material and put wherever you want to put them. Um, you c there'll be time for questions afterwards, but please interrupt if, if there's something you want to ask. Uh, and some, actually, some much earlier projects we did using shipping containers. This was done right at the beginning of the office's founding, before there was any real work, there was no client. We were looking at making a proposal using these, uh, using shipping containers as a very cheap way of making uh, low-cost housing, putting in little bathroom or, or kitchen units uh, into them, and making uh, you know these kind of interior spaces. In fact, the the organ building, our office building, is based on the proportions of a shipping container, making a, a community. Uh, and then uh, this was. Uh, 95 and then, um, 95, 94, 95, and then uh, Kobe was hit by an earthquake. So uh, we proposed this as uh, emergency housing for uh, thousands of people who were without homes temporarily. We said they could live in these things uh, while they're, they're where their house had been. They could build a, f a start building something new, build a, f a f concrete foundation connected to the city infrastructure. Then if they wanted, they could just take these containers home and put them on top of the concrete base. Uh, and uh, if they didn't want them, we could send them back to the shipyards and they could be reused, reused by, by ships or, or sent somewhere else in the world that might be needed. Uh, and the city of Kobe was very interested in the idea. Uh, it looked as if they were going to um, at least make some prototypes. Uh, then right about that time, there was the, the poison gas attack on the Tokyo subways by this um, doomsday cult. Uh, and when the cult was investigated, it was discovered that they were using shipping containers as solitary confinement punishment for bad cult members, and, uh, and at that time public perception of shipping containers as accommodation was not positive, so we, uh, the, the, the project was cancelled. And they, were used, they used these prefabricated houses, and I think they, they, had, they needed 10,000 or something, and they had a terrible problem actually getting rid, of the, getting rid of the houses when they weren't needed. They had to throw them away and they had a lot of trash, which wouldn't have happened with shipping containers. And we also proposed, uh, again without a client, uh, this idea, another neo-metabolist project where you uh, your shipping containers are your bedrooms or your, your study or whatever. Uh, when you have another child or you need more space, you add another branch to the concrete uh, infrastructure tree and put another container. If you're going away on sabbatical or on holiday, you take your bedroom or your office uh, by truck uh, where, wherever else it, uh, it needs to be temporarily. No client yet. Uh, and then I'll show you uh, another house that we did uh, build in Kobe after the earthquake. Uh, which is kind of a container house. Um, the clients for the house said, uh, well, if I begin by saying the entire neighborhood where the house, the original house stood, was, was destroyed. It looked like there had been, it looked like a, a war zone. Uh, and we knew that very quickly that neighborhood would be replaced by generic catalog housing because the catalog housing companies were going around the, uh, the relief centers and saying, please sign here and with your insurance, you'll have a house in three months. And so the neighbors, neighborhoods that had been destroyed were quickly replaced with catalog uh, kit set tract housing. Uh, so, we, so for us, we knew that right now there was no context. There was just destruction. And we knew that in a, in a year or two, there would also be another kind of no context of this kind of generic uh, kit set housing. So um, the, the kind of the grain of the city, that had, the texture of the city that had been built up over, over centuries was all gone. Uh, so our attitude was this house had to be a, a mini city. It had to be a kind of a micro-urbanism that had all the kind of interest and variety uh, uh, necessary for a kind of an interesting uh, environment because that wouldn't be available around the house. So uh, 
our idea was not to make anything complicated. We didn't want to make complicated shapes. Instead, we stacked up some very simple shapes, uh, and it's in the relationship of the, the disjunction of those simple shapes is where the interest and complexity uh, appears. So this is a conceptual diagram. It shows uh, a layering. We, we named this house strata, uh, as in several layers of, of stuff. Uh, independent and distinctive layers. So you begin with these the circles down below, the, the, the yellow slabs up above, the little purple spots above that. And uh, that was the kind of conceptual basis for designing the house. This is the house itself. Um, there's three concrete drums at ground level, uh, a wooden box sitting on top of them and these little glass pavilions sitting on top of that, three independent uh, layers. Uh, and uh, the family uh, is in fact an extended family, there's an elderly couple, there's their daughter and her husband, and there is the unmarried sister of the wife of the elderly couple. And so there are three independent lives uh, going on in this house, uh, and all the, the only instructions to us was we don't want anything to remember the old house by, but we do want a big garden as we had in the old house. So the strategy was to turn the entire site into a garden, uh, place three independent, uh, here's the, from the other side, three independent concrete drums in that garden which you have to go outside to go between, and then stack a kind of a shared uh, volume, the wooden box, which sits on top, spans across those three drums. You can go up into the box, across, and then down again to move between the concrete drums without uh, going outside. And then these little glass uh, tea houses on, on the roof deck. Uh, and here's the house. So these, this photo was taken just after it was finished, so what you see is dirt is now lush uh, greenery. Uh, and what you see is bright orange is a slightly more uh, subdued color. Uh, that was just after it was finished. Um, so you have these um, the three, the three concrete volumes and the wooden volume. We lost the glass pavilions because of budget. The clients said they would build them at some point in the future, but uh, it, never, it hasn't happened so far uh, by night from the other side. And then, um, having stacked up uh, the wood box on top of the concrete, instead of being just kind of completely uh, separate elements, uh, we connected them with uh, enormous acrylic tubes. This is inside the box. That's uh, a, an acrylic tube which has a top, uh, skylight uh, at the roof level and penetrates right through to the lower level and brings in natural light to the, uh, the concrete uh, level. And here you can see in this image, on the ceiling there, that is the underside of that tube. Uh, that's daylight coming into the space on the lower level. And then uh, on the so on the ground, the, the the lower level, the concrete level, the rooms are like uh, independent volumes floating within the larger circles, and with some uh, pieces of built-in furniture. Uh, okay, next project. Um, this is a, uh, an apartment building uh, for Osaka. Despite this image, it's a very dense urban situation. It's beside a railway line. The proposal to the client was to build, first of all, build an enormous billboard uh, against the railway line that gives uh, privacy and sound insulation for the residents, uh, and you can earn money by renting the, the billboard space. Uh, isn't it, uh, another view of it. Then between the apartments and the billboard, uh, you have this grand flight of stairs and you have little bridges connecting across uh, from the billboard to the, the apartments. The billboard contains long bridges as uh, the, the external uh, circulation paths. Uh, simple model. And there is the, the project divided up. These kind of series of elements just put one after the other in, in, in sequence, kind of uh, just juxtaposed. Uh, and that project didn't get built. The client finally decided he, he, didn't ha he lacked the courage to go ahead with it and he commissioned someone else to do something much more ordinary. But we did have another chance with another project to build something similar. It's not by a railway line, it doesn't have advertising, but it does have an enormous screen wall of perforated metal uh, giving privacy. Uh, pr it's the circulation for, for exterior circulation for the, the apartments and also giving privacy and sound insulation uh, for the apartments to the street. Uh, the, the material here, um, the material that this wall is covered in, uh, was a custom material. We, we were using so much of it, we were able to actually work with the, the metal fabricators and, and have them uh, make a, a specially designed perforated panel. So, um, from the other side, 
the apartments step back uh, to allow the maximum amount of sun uh, to come into each, each apartment. And then the, the unusual aspect of the planning is that uh, the normal uh, sequence of a building like this would be the staircases, then the bridges, the kind of the, not the bridges, the staircases, then the access corridors to each apartment, then the apartments. But here, the access corridors are put on the very outside, and the stair goes, the main stair goes between, perhaps this is a better image. Here, the main stair is going, the main stair is against the apartments, then the uh, bridges are beyond that. So you um, uh, go from those long bridges across these little, small bridges uh, into each apartment. And what that does is it creates a much bigger buffer zone between the street and the apartments and better privacy, better sound installation. And so there, that's inside the perforated uh, metal wall. And then uh, it's not a tall building. I think it's, it's only a th uh, three levels high. But uh, the upper level apartments uh, have access to a roof deck. There's a, a ladder going up uh, to these uh, private, I mean, not visually private, but these, each of these decks belongs to the person in the uppermost apartment below them. And then another project that um, uh, also dealt with this idea of, of uh, stacking up a bunch of uh, individual things, separate things, uh, to make a, a larger composition. This is a house in Kyoto. Uh, in the south part of Kyoto, it's between a river and a rice field, and the, the, the rice the fields are somehow protected legally. They'll never be built on, so the view will be maintained out towards, towards the, the left-hand side. And the idea was to put each different uh, uh, programmatic component uh, into its own box. Uh, so you have the, the living room box, the bedroom box, the, the staircase box, the, the gallery box. The, the guy collects art, so the, the left-hand double-height glass volume is, is his... Uh, uh, space for displaying artworks. But then beyond that, the exterior space was also contained in a box. So this is, on the left hand side is the, uh, the main living room, uh, but this image is of the exterior terrace. There's a lap pool uh, and, uh, um, but this space is contained within a box of metal mesh. So it's exterior but slightly interior. And this idea of, of collecting together the boxes, so in a way it's somehow not modular, but there is a, there's an ordering, but it's, the grid is, there's an orthogonal grid, but the dimensions of the grid are free. So as each box is added, it doesn't need to conform to any module. Uh, and this is, this is the latest version. The client, well, and for budget reasons and for the, for the client's sake, uh, all of the different materials, the wood and the stone and everything, were uh, cancelled, and it's now a combination of uh, aluminium, uh, white, plastered concrete, and bare concrete. And uh, starts construction next month. Uh, and then another house in Tokyo, a uh, very large house, um, which is designed as a stack of boxes. Um, and uh, the reason for that is we see uh, Tokyo City, in terms of its urban structure, there's not really any kind of coherent structure. There's certainly no structure that you understand as a pedestrian. What there is, is a collection of boxes. And they're just, their relationship is they are next to each other. That's how sophisticated the relationship gets. There's really no more uh, uh, coherence to the, to the city structure. So we made a, a, a collection of boxes and stacked them up. Concrete, stone, aluminium, all on a pile. Uh, and then inside that, um, the rooms themselves, the spaces themselves are also not really integrated, they're just next to each other. And so there you see a computer image from above of the boxes, and the boxes are offset. So where the boxes slide away from each other, uh, you have space for light uh, to come in from above. There are almost no windows in the facades. And again, a, a contained uh, a private courtyard. And there's the house itself. So you see um, on the lower level, you have a couple of concrete boxes. Uh, above that you have a stone box, and above that you have an aluminium box, and they're all slightly skewed, slightly uh, offset, slightly slid away from one another. So that's the kind of the casual stacking of boxes we saw as the essence of Tokyo City by night.
There's um, that's the, the government district in the background again, uh, Tange's, uh, some towers of Tange, not not the not the city hall, but that's Shinjuku in the background. Uh, some of the interior spaces uh, each has an independent a character, independent uh, uh, finishes. Uh, and you can see uh, this is uh, this is on the middle level, so you're below the aluminium box, so you can see that on the ceiling, and you can see on the, the right hand side that's where the um, upper aluminium box is slid away from the lower the stone box you're standing in in this photo, and light is coming in from above and looking from the opposite direction. And you can see even at, at a detail level you have, uh, for example, this glass wall is sliding away from uh, from the corner there, the, the theme of the house is, is slippage or uh, a kind of a casualness about the way things meet. Uh, a kind of a contemporary version of the traditional, the washitsu, the Japan, traditional Japanese room. The bedroom. Uh, through the, through the, the um, trans, translucent glass there is, is a, a void cut, cut through the building to bring in light from, from the skylight down to the uh, lower levels. And here you see, this is the main entrance. This is the entrance stair from the parking area. Um, and you can see, again, at a detail level, you have uh, slippage. You have the wooden stairs sliding off their concrete base. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the, the, uh, the handrail for the stairs. Uh, as it passes from the uh, concrete box below to the stone box above, they don't quite match up. So what begins as a hole in the wall uh, ends up as an object uh, from above, which you can see here. You're looking back down again. Um, the, the steel is embedded in the concrete, but just beside the stone. Okay, and the next house, uh, this is a house in Kyoto, and I think uh, uh, the, what's interesting about this house and the, the previous house is that the external conditions are almost identical. It's on a site of almost identical uh, size and proportions, 10 meters, 10 meters by 20 meters, uh, and it's for the same number of people in the family, the same number of cars. Almost all the conditions uh, we were given uh, were the same, but uh, what's different is the first one was in, in Tokyo and this one is in Kyoto. And if Tokyo is a collection of boxes, then uh, Kyoto is a network of paths and gardens, of, of uh, it's a, a gridded network of, of connection. So we tried to make this house part of that same, uh, rather than being a, a kind of isolated uh, boxes, uh, shut off boxes, this is part of the, the network of, of Kyoto's uh, circulation paths. So uh, one of the reasons for that is that the client said to us he wanted the biggest possible garden, but he has, he has three children, he has three cars, he, has, uh, uh, he needs a home office, he needs uh, uh, you know, exactly the same program as the, the, the previous house. Uh, and there was, just wasn't space on the site to also have a big garden. So the solution was to uh, make the roof deck the garden, uh, so to use the site twice. But rather than a Corbusian floating roof deck, to actually connect it into the street. So to so actually walk in off the street and start climbing the steps up onto the roof, uh, a bit like the Casa Malaparte in Capri. And then having made a mountain of steps as the form of the house, this, the interior spaces were carved out like, uh, like caves, conceptually excavated from this volume of this mountain. And then uh, you, you have this, this landscape of, uh, of a kind of a web of circulation that is part of the street. It's linked into the street. And I, well, this is an opportunity, I think, just for this particular house because uh, I gave another lecture on this house where I went through the design process. Uh, this is, a, uh, I think, uh, where I can show you how our, our design process works. We don't use computers to design. Uh, and we don't think it's possible, but maybe that's our own uh, our inadequacy. We design everything by hand with colored pencils, uh, and it's taken to a fully resolved level before it ever gets into a computer. It's, I'm saying that only because I've been showing so many computer graphic images. I don't want you to think that's how it was designed, that's how it's presented. So if I go through um, some of these, these uh, hand-drawn sketches to show you the way the house was designed, uh, and then um, the, I'll show you the house itself. So axonometrics. This house was complicated because of the, it's, you can't separate the, in the first floor, the second floor, the third floor. Everything was integrated because of the way it stepped up in, in a kind of a, a staggered sequence. And uh, one thing we always do is draw perspectives of pretty much every uh, house, every space in the house, in a building, 
not as a presentation technique, as a design technique, because we're working directly with the shape of the space, and we want to see what it looks like in three dimensions, and this is how we can have meetings with perspective drawings drawn by hand. Uh, these drawings were never shown to the client. They're, pu they're purely for our own internal uh, development. So it was... Uh, it was also, we also needed these to, to work it out ourselves uh, and to talk to the builder. So here's the house itself. Um, to, the, to the street, it has a very simple, very blank facade. We, we think that it, uh, urban Japan is so kind of complex and messy that the kindest thing to do is to make the simplest possible uh, street uh, image. So it's this um, simple white volume. Uh, it's been scooped away. You see on the lower level there are aluminium panels where it's been scooped away for uh, car parking. Uh, if you know Kyoto in the background, that's Arata Isozaki's concert hall at the end of the street there. So parking. On the left-hand side is the front door. Uh, on the right-hand side is the gate beyond which you see the start of the steps. Okay, into the house first. This is the, the entrance. You take your shoes off here uh, and then into the main uh, uh, living room. Uh, the, the shape you see on the um, left-hand side, which looks like a stair, uh, that's the underside of the main internal stair. There's an internal stair, uh, a one long right flight of stairs uh, connecting all the different levels. Some other internal uh, images. And here you can see, I think, very clearly that the interior spaces are carved out as if they're caves, three-dimensional uh, sculptings of space. In some cases, uh, the curvature in the roof uh, hides roof beams, which would otherwise be um, you know, cubic or rectangular volumes, it hides them behind a curve. Uh, in other cases, it's, I won't say decorative, but it's, it's sculptural. It's not, it doesn't have a functional uh, reason behind it. And this is the main stair I mentioned before. This is the internal stair that connects all the different levels. Uh, one of the, the bedrooms. And this is, uh, this is outside. This is the, uh, the courtyard. Uh, you can see on the far right the stairs going up. Then you have the central courtyard, then the, the interior space. Uh, and in fact, the planning, the organization of the house is very, very similar to a traditional house in that you have this... Uh, you have the front door right on the street, but you also have uh, uh, a long uh, a roji, a, a corridor, an exterior corridor leading to a, a little courtyard garden, and then the traditional Japanese room right at the back, which gives its. It was where the grandparents would have lived. They were both uh, had passed on by the end of construction, unfortunately. So it's it's a guest room, but it does have its own separate access. And then, okay, going up the steps, looking back down towards the street. And here is um, the overall uh, roof landscape. Uh, one of the hardest jobs w for a house like this was um, the handrails. We didn't want any handrails, but the client wouldn't accept that. So uh, we tried to find a detail that could be used in every situation, every um, place in the house that needed handrails, but couldn't find a, a good solution for that. So in fact, every different uh, condition uh, gets its own type of handrail. So this is the most complicated one. It's a, um, uh, a kind of a, a chi almost Chinese sculpture of, of uh, square sections, stainless steel pipes. It, um, this, this place was difficult because this is where the, the handrail has to turn the corner. It's the only place uh, where, where a handrail has to turn the corner, uh, so it became a sculpture about corners. Uh, and, and another place, there were a series of pipes. And so looking back down onto the, uh, onto the roof deck. And even though from the street it looks like a very kind of severe modernist uh, facade, uh, I think from above looking down it actually fits in very nicely with the paths and the gardens and the, and the tiled roofs of its neighborhood. And then right up the top, this is the, the uppermost uh, part of the roof deck, you have uh, this orange pipe. The client loves orange, that's why orange turns up in the design, and he was worried that our design, he kept complaining the design was far too uh, uh, subdued in its colors. We just wanted the natural colors of, of, <coughs> of the wood and the concrete. Uh, white, white's a default, it's not a color, it's just a default neutrality. Uh, but, um, but finally, at this point, uh, that pipe is actually stainless steel, 
uh, but it's, it's industrial grade, uh, industrial bore gauge, stainless steel, it's huge. Uh, and so you can't buy this pre-polished at that size. It's used in factories and boats. Uh, so um, it was actually cheaper to paint it than to polish it. So we, we were able to accept painting this orange. And finally it became a kind of a, uh, it, it's an analog of the traditional Japanese tori gate, the kind of the orange uh, gate that signifies the entrance to a Shinto shrine. And every house should have one. Uh, and uh, from here you get a great view of the mountains around Kyoto. Uh, there it is in its context. <coughs> If, if you haven't been to Kyoto, the entire city uh, has an edge. It's, it's the most unusual city in Japan because it has a grid structure and it has a boundary. It stops where, you, where it meets the mountains on three sides. Uh, by law, you cannot build on those mountains. And then another house, which is actually um, in the same neighborhood uh, and a much smaller house uh, for a much, much lower budget. <coughs> Excuse me. W was there some water? Oh, Excuse me. So, um, this house, um, in this neighborhood, there, I mean, there, are, there are strong building codes in Japan, believe it or not. Not aesthetic ones, but in terms of uh, height and floor area. Uh, in this neighborhood, basically people build two, possibly three stories. We managed to put uh, four stories, four levels, into this house by having um, very low ceilings. Uh, but then that was compensated for by using um, voids, but using notches to connect uh, between the levels. Uh, to, to m not make it feel much more spacious. So finally, the house becomes like a single, uh, a single space. You m and imagine it as a beginning as a, as a rectangular, a cubic volume that it then has notches carved out of it, like, a bit like the, uh, a sculpture by uh, Eduardo Cholida. And um, where those notches overlap, you have the connections between levels. And uh, there, are, there are strict floor area uh, restrictions. There are restrictions on floor area as well. So we weren't losing any uh, space by taking those notches out. We, could, we couldn't have built it anyway. So there's the house uh, in its uh, context. Uh, notches opening the, uh, it out to the city in different directions. Rice field to the, to the left. Rice, I don't know, maybe it's some kind of agriculture. And here you can see, for example, you're looking out to the city and you have a notch, uh, a void open to the level above. Uh, and yeah, you can see here that this is the, the mid-level mid uh, living area. And there's a, there's a balustrade there because um, uh, the entire glass uh, walls can slide away, opening the corner, making it an exterior balcony in good weather. That's it closed. Uh, yeah, some of these uh, notched connected spaces. The ceilings are low, but in places there are connections to uh, other levels. And light comes in from different uh, directions. The traditional tatami mat uh, room. And then... Um, uh, not finally, but almost finally. This project is, um, <coughs> is uh, a, a, a pavilion, uh, a, a multi-purpose pavilion, uh, which is about, it's, um, there's no site, deliberately no site, it can be anywhere, there's no client, we're looking for one. It's a stack of glass uh, rings, glass discs, uh, solid glass, uh, with notches carved out of them. They can all rotate independently. You can line up the notches in the internal circulation uh, Oops. You can line up the notches in internal circulation in different combinations, make different shapes of space. Uh, and uh, there's its scale. I will explain that that sphere up above uh, is not real. That's a, a virtual uh, image. And that virtual image is gained when you're standing inside the, uh, the central space. If you line up all the discs correctly, you get a pyramid-shaped uh, void at the center. 
if you stand uh, at the base of that and look up, uh, any images reflecting off the, the walls, the glass walls of the pyramid, will appear to be an enormous uh, sphere above you. So you have, if you, if the, this is looking up, if the, the discs are offset, uh, and then the media images, we, we, have, we worked with a media artist, a multimedia artist, uh, they just make this kaleidoscopic mess. If you line it up uh, to create the pyramid, you get the optical illusion of a sphere floating above you. So the project is a, a solid a cylinder, a, a void pyramid, and a virtual sphere. Uh, I, I'm just, we have not much time left. I'll just run through a couple of other projects very quickly. This is a department store we were asked to do in Kyoto. Uh, and the idea was to make a building that somehow was sensitive to Kyoto architecture without looking kitsch. So there's, there's a pitched roof, there's a, there are wood louvers, they wouldn't be wood in the end, wood uh, louvers all across the facade. Some of the interior shots. Deliberately uh, slightly confusing circulation because that's a positive thing in the department store to keep people accidentally running to the shops they weren't intending to go to. And looking down, there's a, a, a series of, of, the restaurants are all up on the top level. Uh, there's a garden, a single garden, but it's a complicated shape, which means that all, they all feel like they kind of have their own private garden, but you can walk through that garden to the other restaurants if you want. Some of the computer graphics of the interior, uh, the central so, uh, space, and that upper level with the restaurants. And then finally, I just want to talk briefly about something that we, we did uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we set up another company. The other company is called uh, FOB Homes. Um, uh, we realized that at, at FOBA, we were designing a lot of houses uh, for people who were wealthy or they were interested in avant-garde architecture. And we made them one nice house, but it had no effect on uh, the general quality of housing in Japan, which is not good. Most uh, new suburban uh, housing is... Um, uh, Kitset catalog, not well. Kitset is not the right word. Catalog, generic uh, home is built by people called housemakers. Uh, they're expensive. They're not cheap, and they're not social housing. Uh, but we couldn't understand why people insisted on going to them. We knew we we competed in terms of price. We knew we we did better architecture. Uh, but it seemed to be that there was the reassurance uh, of a brand name, and uh, the feeling that other people were getting the same one it was psychologically very important. Uh, so, you know, the avant-garde avant -garde houses you see coming out of Japan, there's a very tiny percentage of the population who are willing to commission those. So we decided to make a brand name, and, uh, which was FOB Homes, um, which gives a more standardized uh, kind of house, more of a known quantity. So uh, w there was an aesthetic that was standard, there was a kind of space planning that was standard. We made some typologies, five different typologies, uh, which they could choose and modify to fit their family and to fit their site. Uh, and uh, to reassure people that it was, um, the cost was more or less fixed, not construction cost, but the design cost was fixed. They kind of knew what they were getting. Uh, and uh, so we did it in collaboration with uh, FOB Corp, which is an import uh, company based in Tokyo. The reason for the, the, the same name is that um, FOB Corp was set up by Katsu Umubayashi's aunt, the boss of FOBA, my, my boss. His aunt set up FOB Corp about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, as an import company. And when Katsu set up his own architect's office, for the, because of the family connection, he used a similar name. But there was no intention of doing work together. And then he had this brainwave of uh, making a brand name for housing and thought, hey, we have a distribu distribution network already in place. So we could uh, market the houses through FOB Co-op uh, and they're then referred to us in Kyoto. They think they're dealing with a nationally known brand name. It's actually just a small architecture office in Kyoto. Uh, but, I mean, once they see that, you know, they, um, they're already uh, involved. They're already uh, happy to be, to be working with us. Uh, so we, we have these five basic prototypes. Uh, again, the, the common theme is they're basically white boxes. Uh, the common theme is spatial continuity which uh, seems like a radical modern thing. It's actually very close to traditional Japanese housing to have this kind of continuous space. Uh, and, uh, and then they look, tend to look like this. This is the first one that was built. Uh, and what seems like a very kind of, um, seems very assertive actually in Japan, it's a very kind of receding type of architecture. It's not aggressive in the street. Uh, it kind of doesn't stand out at all. It's like part of the street has been erased. And there's no complaints from the neighbors. They think it's a very positive uh, to have this uh, simple white form. The guy on the left of this particular house uses the, the blank wall he's facing as a video projection screen from his living room. 
he has the speakers uh, in his living room and he, he watches a very large uh, image. Uh, and by concentrating all the windows into as much as possible into one wall, or using internal courtyards, uh, <coughs> by putting a blank wall to the neighbors, that's the kindest thing you can do because in Japan, the houses are so close to one another, everyone just closes their curtains. So if you cut yourself off in, in, from a, a neighbor, they can open their curtains. And psychologically, they, they even have your yard space as part of their uh, airspace. So what seems very arrogant towards context is actually very kind. And then inside the house, you have as much as possible space for continuity. So this is the living room, uh, the, and the, the dining room, and the kitchen. Up above, behind that handrail height wall, is the bedroom. So it's all part of the same air, the same light, the same sound. Uh, and which, um, uh, of course, has a, there's a problem with heating and cooling. So cooling's okay. We have, we've set up the windows so you can get, very easily get good drafts, good uh, breezes through the house uh, in summer. Uh, but uh, in winter, when it's very cold, there's underfloor heating below this concrete floor. It's a concrete mortar floor. Uh, in Japan, even in a modern house like this, you take your shoes off. So you're in socks or bare feet. If your feet are warm, somehow it doesn't matter that the air is a little chilly. Somehow it's, uh, it makes you feel warm all over. So there's another view of the same space looking out into the courtyard garden. So with the sliding glass doors open between the courtyard and the living room, it's all really a single space. Part of it doesn't have a roof. And there's out in the courtyard. And this is what, uh, this is where all the, um, behind this frosted glass wall is the uh, courtyard, and that's pretty much all the windows that are out of the street. And that's, uh, that's all I have to show tonight. But feel free to ask questions. Have you received a lot of orders for these houses? Yeah, we've, uh, we've built about 15. And we have another 15 underway. Which, in terms of housing in Japan, is nothing. But for us, it's, it's important. Yeah, all, of the, all of them the same? The same no, no, uh, I just showed the first one. That's the most severe, the most extreme prototype. The others, you know, have more windows or they're different shapes. I didn't have time to show other examples. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, um, the first one, it cost, uh, say, in US dollars, say, 350000 But you can't compare, I mean, right. Japanese prices and American prices. It would change based on on the, the, the new family and the new site. So we, built, we have built that one several times, but it's different because the site's different. The technology used is pretty much the same. That hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. I think, I think it's even conceivable if we got a lot of orders, we would join with one of the catalog housing companies in Japan and become consultants and sell the franchise or whatever. Okay.